Hello class, Professor Annabelle back. As promised, now we're going to talk about uh, the Battle of Little Bighorn. Or, as it's romantically known, Custer's Last Stand. So, uh, before we can uh, talk about that battle in particular, we want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about uh, the main central figure of this, as far as uh, most Americans are concerned, George Armstrong Custer. Now, Custer has been romanticized for uh, decades in America, and it's not until recently that people have really become aware of what he was all about and the real Custer. So let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, George Armstrong Custer uh, went to West Point. He barely graduated from West Point. He was a troublemaker, received so many demerits, he was nearly expelled. But he held on, and he graduated last in his class from West Point. When you graduate from West Point, you're immediately commissioned an officer. Custer, very quickly, because... He graduated shortly before the Civil War began, uh, becomes an officer in the Union Army. He'll rise very quickly through the ranks to the rank of general. He's a cavalry leader, and he's known uh, for by some for his extreme bravery during the Civil War and by others for his daring foolishness. I guess it's all the way you look at it. Custer was known in many cases to rally his troops by uh, getting on his horseback and riding back and forth in front of the enemy lines, uh, taunting them by taking off his hat and waving it at him with his long flowing blonde hair. Uh, and this would really get his men riled up the Confederates would all take pot shots at him, but if you know anything about the muskets they used back then, if you try to hit a moving man on horseback, you, you know, you're never going to hit him. And Custer knew that. So, he rises through the ranks, to the rank of general during the war. He's highly publicized and popular and becomes quite a figure in American uh, society in the 1860s. After the war, he's a career military man, like many of the leaders of the Union Army. He'll remain in the military, and he'll be transferred out west, uh, and ultimately be engaged in the so-called Indian Wars that uh, mainly happened in the 1870s. Now, Custer, uh, one of his first uh, things that he's involved in is uh, an incident where it's going to force the United States military to demote him in rank. And what's going to happen is he's stationed out at a fort in the middle of nowhere in Wyoming, I believe it was, and he gets extremely homesick. So he does what's known in the military as going AWOL. That means absent without leave. He had been requesting leave to go and visit his wife, who lived back in Monroe, Michigan, which is in southern Michigan, only about 20 miles north of the Ohio border on Lake uh, Erie. He uh, doesn't get permission, so one day he just hops on his horse and leaves anyway. Rides all the way back to Monroe, Michigan. It doesn't take the Army long to figure out where the hell he went. They send, uh, you know, troops to his home in Monroe. He's arrested. He's put on military trial. And he's demoted from the rank of general down to colonel. <clears throat> so that's a big black mark against him in his military career. Uh, the next thing that Custer's going to be involved in... He's going to be the end up being the commander 
of the 7th Cavalry Unit. And that's going to be his unit uh, until his demise at Little Bighorn. One of the assignment that the 7th Cav receives is they're uh, instructed to uh, accompany a group of mining executives and supposed scientists on an exploration of the Black Hills of South Dakota. <clears throat> Let me explain a little bit to you about the Black Hills. The Black Hills were a sacred place, especially uh, to Native American tribes like the Lakota, which you may commonly know as the Sioux, and the Cheyenne. <clears throat> they believed that the Black Hills were a sacred place and that if a person went there when they died, if they died in the Black Hills, and a lot of elders were taken there when they knew they were near death so they could die there, that you would go directly to heaven. So there were treaties signed between the Lakota and the Cheyenne uh, at a famous fort out west, Fort Laramie. And in these treaties, the Lakota and the Cheyenne gave up tremendous amounts of territory to the United States government in exchange for the solemn promise that the Black Hills of South Dakota would be off limits to white people forever, that no one could go there. It's a sacred place. It's a giant burial ground, too. <clears throat> so, uh, as we'll be talking about in later lectures, one of the things that dominated the American West during the Gilded Age and before is the so-called mining frontier. And it's an oddball situation where it's the only frontier that America has that moves in the opposite direction from west to east because it started with, in 1849 with the gold discoveries on the American River southeast of San Francisco. And when the gold and silver fields of California played out, uh, Americans moved into Nevada to find more precious metal. Then into Colorado, the Pikes Peakers found tremendous amounts of silver. And they're running out of places to look. Rumors are flying around that the Black Hills of South Dakota are filled with gold. But, big problem. Government has agreed, no whites can go there. The government starts bending the rules and breaking the Treaty of Fort Laramie as they broke most treaties by allowing the, this official expedition to go in and see what was really in the Black Hills of South Dakota, even though they're not even supposed to be there. And Custer and the 7th Cavalry was the military detachment assigned to accompany them. So they go into the Black Hills. Lo and behold they discover there's a lot of gold there. They come out, have a press conference, make this stunning announcement, which obviously the mining officials knew before they even went there, that there's gold in them there hills. And what that does is it spurs a gold rush in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And the gold there is unique. I don't know if you've ever seen Black Hills gold, but there's a certain mineral in it that gives it sort of a pink hue. In fact, sometimes it's known as pink gold. <clears throat> so you got all these greedy white people running rough shot through this sacred area that's supposed to be off bounds to them. This is what triggers the Plains Indian Wars of the 1870s. So Plains Indians band together. Uh, Cheyenne, Lakota, and other tribes put together a huge military force of over 5,000 warriors, and they start attacking forts and settlements all across the West, and they're wreaking havoc in the 1870s. Now, <clears throat> this will all start to culminate in 1876. Now, what happens here is the United States government starts to get really serious about what they were considering at first an quote-unquote Indian uprising. 
<clears throat> and they send out a large detachment of the United States military to back up the army that was already there. And they're bound and determined that they're going to find this large force of mainly Lakota and Cheyenne and destroy them once and for all. So they gather together and form a unit in Wyoming and uh, different cavalry units, including Colonel Custer and the 7th Cav, are given orders to go on reconnaissance missions in different directions. <clears throat> and their orders are locate this giant battle group. When you find them, send a messenger back to headquarters in Wyoming so we can send a huge force that will attack them and do away with them once and for all. So all these different cavalry units go in different directions. Custer's headed north into Montana. He will end up marching for two straight days, only stopping to water his horses. Reason why he's so hell-bent on finding this group? We know now today, after uh, his wife wrote uh, books about him, Custer had presidential aspirations. He believed that if he could do something really heroic out west to add to his Civil War record, that he'd be the perfect Republican candidate for the presidency. And remember the old Republican formula from back then uh, that I talked about during the politics stage of the Gilded Age. The Republicans were looking for a union officer from the state of Ohio. Well, it wouldn't take much for Custer to move to Ohio. He lived 20 miles north of the border. So, he thought if he could pull this off and make him president. After marching for two straight days, and with the assistance of his Crow Indian scouts, he had scouts attached to the 7th Cavalry that were employees of the United States Army. And the reason why Crow Indians would serve, it, serve in this capacity is they were mortal enemies to the Lakota and Cheyenne. So it's helping the army defeat their enemy. <clears throat> they come upon uh, an area in Montana, and the Crow Scouts see the first signs. They've seen some tracks, but now way off in the distance, they see the evidence of the smoke of campfires. So these Crow Indian Scouts and Custer climb up onto this bluff, and they're trying to look down into this uh, river valley, gully sort of area. Uh, the water that flows through this area is Little Bighorn Creek, or as the native people called it, Greasy Creek. Now, from their vantage point, they couldn't see directly down in there, but they could see numerous campfires from the smoke coming up from them. So the Crow Indian scouts were convinced that's where this giant contingency of Native Americans are encamped. And they know there's at least 2,500 warriors at this point by 1860, uh, or excuse me, 1876. I may have misspoke earlier, but we're in the year 1876 now. Uh, all hell broke loose in the early 1870s, and these, this is an ongoing process of warfare between the Plains Indians and uh, the uh, United States military. All told, there's 5,000 Native Americans because when tribes travel, just like Black Kettle and the Southern Cheyenne, everybody goes with them. They don't just send off their warriors because they knew they're going to be chased around by the United States military and they'd stop at nothing. So, Custer and the Crow Scouts return back to uh, the 7th Cavalry. And the 7th Cavalry, uh, is, you know, he barks out orders to them, which obviously uh, is disobeying orders that were given directly to him. Just a second, I'm looking for one figure here that I need to share with you guys. I know it's kind of falling apart here. Okay, so... <clears throat> Remember Custer's orders. 
As soon as he finds this group, which he apparently has, he's supposed to send a messenger back to Wyoming to get the entire military. Then they'll all attack together. Custer's going to disobey orders. He divides the 7th Cavalry into three groups. All told, in the 7th Cavalry, there's about 700 and an odd number of men. He takes two units and sends them off in other directions. He and the main unit of the 7th Cavalry, which including himself is 264 men, are going to attack direct on to the encampment. Then the way the plan's supposed to work, after they attack directly, the other two groups of the 7th Cav, which would be, you know, 200 and some 50 strong each, would then attack from different flanks. But Custer and his men were going to direct, directly attack head on. So, that's what happens. Now remember, he's disobeyed orders. His men are dead tired. They've rode two straight days with no rest. But Custer's hell-bent on pulling off some sort of big, great victory to thrust himself into the White House in his convoluted mind. So, Custer attacks, and it's going to be a situation where there are 2,500 seasoned warriors. A couple of them you've probably heard of. The Great Sioux Warriors, or Lakota Warriors, as they prefer to be known, Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse are among these 2,500. Now, I don't care if Custer had George Washington rise out of the grave and assist him in this battle. When it's 2,500 seasoned warriors versus 264, doesn't take much to figure out what the outcome is going to be. In a short period of time, Custer and 263 of his men all died. The other two parts of the 7th Cavalry never did attack when they saw the onslaught of what was happening. They knew better. So, uh, this is the battle of Little Bighorn that's romantically known as Custer's Last Stand. <clears throat> now, later on, you know, there's a famous book, if any of you are interested in this period of history and what happens from a Native American perspective, there's a famous book entitled Black Elk Speaks. Black Elk was a Lakota. And at the time of Little Bighorn, he was just a young man. He was about 18 years old, a young warrior. He will live a long life and he'll witness a lot of different things throughout this period, including what happened at Wounded Knee. In the 20th century, he's interviewed by uh, an anthropologist and he, the anthropologist writes down his life story and it's a very interesting book if you're interested in this time period. I know I enjoyed it. So Black Elk recalls the Battle of Little Bighorn. And this anthropologist asks him, how long did the battle really last? And Black Elk says, well, it took about as long as it takes a man to eat his lunch. 10, 15 minutes at best. Wouldn't take long for 2,500 to take care of 264. And that's exactly what happened. So, to this group of uh, Plains Indians, this is a tremendous victory. Especially when they figured out they killed the dreaded Custer. He's the one who partially spurred this entire war by escorting those people into the Black Hills and triggering that gold rush. They were quite happy with that. So, sooner or later, word gets back to the main contingency of the United States Army down in Wyoming of what had happened. In the meantime, this group of uh, Southern Cheyenne and Lakota know there's going to be more coming after us after that. So what they're going to do is they're going to ride directly north in Montana to the Canadian border and cross into Canada, and they'll have sanctuary there because the Canadian government has let it be known 
American government does not have permission to chase Native Americans across the Canadian border onto our territory. So that's where they're going to go for safety. But here's what real what is really unfortunate about this and starts leading to this whole romanticizing of Custer's last stand. This event happened in late June of seven of eighteen seventy six. By the time the word of Custer's demise gets to the East Coast newspapers in New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and so forth, it will be front page news on July 4th, 1876. A pretty significant date. That's the centennial of the United States, our 100th year anniversary. I remember the bicentennial. I was a young man in 1976. The country started celebrating the bicentennial in 1974, and it all culminated on July 4th, 1976. Similar circumstance in the centennial in 1876. So people in the cities back east all ready to celebrate the 100th anniversary of their beloved nation get up to read the newspaper. Remember, everybody read the newspaper. It's the only form of news. And on the front page is the story about Custer's Last Stand. All 264 killed by bloodthirsty Indians. It's a massacre. It's horrible. Yeah, it was horrible because Custer disobeyed orders. It shouldn't have happened. And it wasn't a massacre. It was a battle. Who attacked who? Custer attacked the Indians in their encampment. This isn't a, a massacre. It isn't a romanticized last stand. We have no idea if Custer died the first man on the battlefield or the last, but the movies always have him dying last. This is going to lead to the romanticizing of this event because on that day, July 4th, 1876, most Americans were basically bleeding red, white, and blue. And this was a stab at patriotism. And they saw it as an attack on America. Their judgment was clouded, and the way it was presented didn't help. Finally, in the 1980s, the truth on Custer really comes out. This guy's nobody to celebrate. He was an egotistical, self-centered idiot, as far as I'm concerned. And most historians are also, I might add. So, that's the unfortunate event of the Battle of Little Bighorn. And that's just going to lead to more hardship for Native American people because shortly after that, you'll see editorials in Eastern newspapers where some prominent editors of newspapers are calling for the outright genocide of Native American people. Wipe them out like animals. They're in the way. And look what they did to beloved Custer. So, that's the end of this lecture. Uh, you'll be viewing some more that I recorded earlier uh, on Native American people and so forth. And don't be confused. I'll introduce these lectures and you'll notice I'll be dressed in winter clothing. And uh, I'll introduce them as a different number than they are because I recorded those lectures last spring when we were in remote learning mode. And I decided to incorporate them with brand new ones like this one into my distance learning courses so it's much closer to actually being in the classroom with me and me telling my stories like I love to do and like a lot of students love to listen to. Whether you do or not, that's personal choice, but that's the way I teach. So, uh, talk to you soon. Give you some updates when I need to. Keep working hard. Get into those discussions. Do what you're supposed to do and you'll do just fine in this course. Be safe, wear your mask. Bye now.